Working Cows Podcast, episode 264. This episode is brought to you by Red Summit Advisors and farmingtheweb.ca. Create your first listing today and receive a $15 Tim Hortons gift card. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network. And this episode is brought to you by Red Summit Advisors. And we are joined today by Ross Bronson from Red Summit Advisors. And we're going to talk to him about managing the five sources of agriculture risk or the five sources of risk in agriculture. And so, uh, Ross has been a guy who's been involved with Red Summit for quite some time and has been involved in all aspects of the beef industry and the cow-calf side of it and all those things. So uh, got some good perspective to bring to that. And he's from the West, a, a place that has um, dealt with drought as one of the sources of agriculture risk being uh, weather-related events. So uh, we're going to talk to him about those things today. So Ross, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. My pleasure. Uh, I was at a management training seminar, I suppose you could call it, uh, a couple of years ago in Canada. And one guy said, you know, in ranching, we tend to make money going up the stairs and we lose money going down the elevator. And I don't know if that was a, you know, I suppose BSE colors their their experience somewhat in, in that <laughs> regard. But um you know, we're talking today about the five sources of agricultural risk or risk in agricultural businesses. And I guess, could you, do you, do you see that as kind of the, the norm <laughs> in agriculture? Um, boy, that, yeah. And I think that, um, I definitely think that's the norm, unfortunately, but my hope and kind of my goal, if any leverage I have in the industry is to start changing that narrative. Uh, so uh, I think it has been the case, you know, we talk about the price of a pickup truck, right. Versus the price of a, of a cow and how you used to be able to sell, you know, I talked to guys, Oh, I came back from college and my dad sold two cows and bought me a new truck. <laughs> well, that does not happen anymore. Um, so yeah, I definitely think it, it is the case that elevator is a scary ride, but, um, I'm hoping that I can change that narrative a little bit. Yeah, and, and I don't know if maybe it's it's easy to take an analogy too far, but I think that some of these tools for managing risk can be kind of the controls within the elevator. Like, okay, we can hit that button and decide we're only going to this floor. <laughs> we're not yeah. going all the way to the basement. <laughs> well, it's totally true. I mean, I think, I think when you talk about risk management in general, there's different ways to approach it. And one of those is, here's my break even and I'm protecting it. And one of those might be, I can absorb... X amount of loss this year. So I'm going to protect a uh, strategic loss or I'm going to try and lock in profits. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways and it's so operation specific, right? You know, your, your goals, your risk tolerance, are you high leverage? You know, you obviously, if you've got a bunch of uh, debt capital, it's going to be a lot harder to absorb some loss than if you're you know, hopefully generational with little overhead and debt. So, right. And the, and the, kind of that forecasting process do you feel like that's a, a something that can be forecasted or you know as far as market conditions and those kinds of things or is it you know, i mean that's part of what what makes it a risk <laughs> is that it can't yeah. be but i mean you're talking about some of those like i i can absorb this loss this year so we're going to use this tool is that i mean is that part of it as far as the forecasting part of it yeah, I think so. And I think this is where I start my plug for financial records, right? Like, I think too many operators don't want to sit down and, and be a pencil pusher, which is fine. I get that. Like, but, but it, this whole discussion, in my opinion, starts with having financial records that show where you're at so that you know what you need and where to protect, right? And so that, that to me, 
is where that forecasting starts. Because if you know that on an average basis, your break even is X, whatever that might be per pound of calf weaned, right? Well, now you can start working backward. Now you can start working at, at, well, okay. So current prices are looking to be, you know, one, 87, 190 something, two something, which is what, you know, we're looking at most recently. And so I know I'm a certain percent above my break even. And so do I want to lock that in? Do I want to uh, just protect that break even, you know, that, and so, so it really, that's my first plug is at ranchers, we've got to do a good job of making sure we got some financial records. And I actually think there's a current emerging market in um, bookkeepers who mm-hmm. can understand the ranching industry and help these these folks kind of pull their stuff together and stay organized. Yeah, and and yeah. On a, you know one one bookkeeper could take on three or four clients, right? right? So I'm I'm kind of pushing that way too. Yeah, and I've got you know I have I have a probably an issue. I've got an award hanging here in my office that is the Jonathan Award for loyal being a loyal friend. So I've got a loyalty issue of who who do I plug? But I don't think yeah. that anybody can take on all of the ranchers in the world. So no. yeah. uh, you know, Patton Bookkeeping Services is a previous guest. Uh, mm-hmm. James Rogers and Marissa Taylor uh, at Northway Ranch Services, and another guest previously just a couple of weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. Um. You know, book uh, Ranch Right LLC, uh, John mm-hmm. Haskell and and his team. Those guys yeah. are all people that I think kind of have that uh, forward looking mindset that yeah. are willing to give you uh, good data, <laughs> actionable yeah. data that you can make a decision uh, with. And and I think that um, can you kind of talk about that the the long term aspect of this strategy uh as far as you know i've got the records i know i know where i'm sitting um and and i know this year is going to be a good year right this is one of those we're going to take a step up (laughs) this isn't an elevator year this is a stairs year uh so can you talk about kind of that long-term strategy and and spreading that those good years out over a number of years to to help with the with the bad years (laughs) Yeah, I think that's such an important thing to touch on. I mean, I think so many of us, maybe our accountants are more tax accountants than than management accountants. And so when all of a sudden we're looking at making a bunch of money this year because our calves are coming in hot, well, they want us to go buy a new pickup and a new stock trailer, right? <laughs> because they're, they're trying to avoid the tax debt. And there may be situations where that makes sense, but I'm not, you know, the, the discussion is, well, does it, does it really make sense? I mean, if you're driving a 2010 even pickup truck and your stock trailer's in good condition, you don't need to do that. And so for me, the long-term vision that you need really needs to be looked at is you need to have capital improvements and capital budgeting, right? So, you know, um, the corrals on the, on the South place, they're falling over and they're not safe and calves are jumping down rails and they need to be on our list. Right. And then create five, well, even one, two, five and 10 year plans of those improvements. And that way, as you start looking at your finances and you, you know where your break even is, you know, you're going to make it this year. You can start budgeting next year. Well, great. Instead of buying a stock trailer and a pickup truck, we're going to do a better hay store. We're going to build a hay barn. So now we don't have the same loss on our, on our hay that we would stacked outside, or I'm going to rebuild those corrals for my human resources, you know, benefit that, that now my cowboys are a little happier. They're not getting ran over all the time because the alley's too wide or, you know what I mean? Whatever it may be. And I also think that in that same discussion, we can talk about other things. It doesn't always have to be infrastructure. It doesn't always have to be livestock related. Like maybe we put some extra money in a, a fund to build it for health insurance for our employees so we can improve that. Maybe we start figuring out how to build a 401k program. So just those types of things that I think so often as ranchers were caught up in this year's calf crop, our breed back and next year's calf crop. And those are obviously really important places to, to look at. But our, we are running businesses. And I think that 
that is a narrative that is changing, which I love and needs to continue changing because it used to be more that it was a lifestyle that you were choosing. And it still is obviously, but that lifestyle has become a business. And so making those long-term business minded decisions, that to me is where, where that, that forecasting goes. Well, and back to, uh, you know, kind of the, or where we were early on in this conversation, uh, you talked about selling two cows and buying a brand new pickup. You know, I had a conversation with a guy who ran a welding shop one time. He said, I bought, when I started this, uh, started this business, I bought my first pickup for brand new for $4,500, paid cash for it in 1981. Uh, you know, and my shop rate was 20 bucks an hour or whatever it was. He said, now yeah. let's go back out by that same new pickup. Can I charge people that much more for my shop rate and still have any business? <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so I think that it, it's, those uh, in those days it was possible to ranch for the lifestyle mm -hmm. yeah it is yeah. no longer possible to ranch for the lifestyle alone uh yeah. there has to be the i's dotted and the t's crossed from a financial perspective for it to be sustainable it was yeah. sustainable in those days because of the increase in asset value the land was appreciating mm -hmm. really quickly <laughs> yeah. And it, I don't know that it is anymore, and I don't know that it will continue to. I would I would anticipate a market correction there, but I don't know. Um, and so I think there's there's up there we've got to we've got to take the time to figure out how whether it's a bookkeeping service or our own discipline of yeah. dotting those eyes and crossing those t's. Yeah, and I think that sustainability is such an important thing. And, and I know the King Ranch Institute recent last year their symposium was kind of defining sustainability and. You know, the way I define sustainability is it, your ability to pass on something viable and profitable to the next generation, which is a big goal for a lot of producers. And it hasn't been happening over the last few generations because we're running into the financial issue, right? So it's just, it's kind of this snowball that builds on itself. Right. You know, and passing it on to the next generation, part of passing it on to the next generation is an, an, a next generation that wants the business. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think well-run businesses, profitable businesses are, are more fun <laughs> yeah, to be around yeah, sure. and probably more attractive for the next generation to want to be a part yeah. of it. So yeah, then my dad used to say your hobby is really fun as long as it makes you money. If it, then it, then it becomes a stress if you do it as your job, you know, it's just, it's just not fun anymore. Mm, yeah. So. Yeah. So I think let's let's turn our attention to these five uh, sources of risk. Um, I think maybe just we'll list them out and then we'll come back to each one of them and talk about some examples and some strategies to to overcome them. So so your five areas of risk are and this all this all comes actually kind of from the the extension program, um, the national extension program. So you're looking at legal risk, human risk financial risk, production risk, and then your marketing risk. Sure. So, so those are your five areas of risk. And, and, you know, we can just start at the top if you want. Yep. So legal, right? Legal, obviously, I don't touch very close because I'm not a lawyer. So that's my first disclaimer is get get a good lawyer that, that you don't have to use all the time, but that's available, right? But this legal risk is anything from um, contracts you've entered into for, you know, products for cattle. It's um, payments on your, your debts, right? Basically, anytime you sign your name to something, you are in some ways entering into a form of a legal contract or something that could be construed as a, a legal contract. So... The important thing here is one, you want to be able to fulfill your, your obligations. And then I think the other side of this is it's important to think about liability in, in today's ranching industry. And I, I, I actually worked a lot in um, ag tourism as well as production. Mm -hmm. So I got to see this liability on a very firsthand basis, you know, and unfortunately, um, not to say we're surrounded by idiots necessarily, but let's just say that the logic in a large part of the country is lacking these days. 
and somebody's going to climb your fence. And it's, it's, it might be something that seems so absurd to us. Like, wow, that calf's really cute. I'm going to go look at it. And we all know how that ends for 70, 80, 90% of cows. Right. <laughs> so that's another thing we really need to consider. And, and is, is what type of liability coverage do you have? Is that insurance? Are you looking at, um, are you looking at, uh, liability waivers. Mm. So th- that's kind of the, the two prong approach there. Of that one is, is one, you know, legal agreements and, and contracts and two liability. Yeah. Very good. And I, I mean, like just a real simple example, uh, an LLC or some kind of a, a way of separating the business from the persons yeah. involved in the business to make sure that the people don't become financially liable in the event of, you know, some kind of it. So that's, it's an example of a, a mitigation strategy. So yeah. Yeah. uh, Business structures is a big one. Right. For sure. Right. And then the human one, uh, we talk about human risk and I don't know if you've ever heard this, uh, but the, the five D's we talk about death, disease, divorce, disaster, disagreement, you know, those are are kind Mm -hmm. of the five D's that go along with that. Would you, are you, is that kind of the channel you're thinking in there as far as human risk? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the point here is that there are people involved in your operation. And I think that for a long, long time, uh, be it because of necessity or whatever, we just haven't put a lot of effort into the human side of ranching. And part of that is because man, early on, we were a bunch of, mean cusses you know you had to be to survive right like when you're out in weather and dealing with rank cattle and rank court you're just not a softy <laughs> <laughs> and i've known some great guys but you know we're not there's not a bunch of softies in the ranching industry but so so back to your d's right like those are all encompassing because you need mental health for your employees you need physical safety and health for your employees and you need um intellectual property to stay viable and available Mm. right so if grandpa is the only one that does the books and he's 85 90 years old we need somebody else in there looking at the books you know somebody's got to know so that when and if we're all mortal you know when when grandpa goes we'll 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 lay him to rest with his saddle and and then we got to come back and run the business so and, you know, you talked about divorce and that, and, and it just think it's, it's so important that we have a balance here. And this is hard. This is hard in the ranching industry because if we're not going to work big, long hours and days, we're going to have a higher labor cost because we need to spread that labor over more people. And so um, this conversation, I think, is happening, especially as we watch fewer of the next generation come back, or for that matter, the ability to hire quality employees. Um, This conversation is definitely going on. And I think that a big part of that too, is just the efficiency of the, of the modern ranch compared to the efficiency of the, the less modern ranch, you know, I mean, those it's, it's a, a necessity or a function of just the, the way things are happening that one guy can take care of more acres and more cows today than he yeah. could 50 years ago, or maybe less than that. But for sure, 50 years ago, one guy can take care of more acres and more cows. So it doesn't require 13 kids, you yeah. know, to, to get this place taken care of it anymore, like it yeah. used to. And so it's just kind of the, the way things are happening. And so I, I think that there is, uh, just those are some realities that we've got to face. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, some good examples I think of this are are um, you know I, I think it may be Elaine Fraze who talks about you know her son. They've got an agreement with her daughter in law, and she knows that if her son passes away, she's still taken care of by the family. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's yeah. that, but they have that in in writing, and and everybody's aware of it, and there's good communication, you know? And so I, I think that's a, a really helpful example. Do you have anything else along those lines as far as examples or, or things that people should be thinking about? Yeah. I mean, I think it goes even to the other end where, where I think 
the older generation doesn't want to just be abandoned and feel like mm. they're put out to pasture. Right. So uh, some sort of structure where there's, even if it's not maybe a legal structure, but where there's a board that meets on a monthly basis and can talk about what's going on so that, you know, dad or grandpa is still involved in that conversation. And, and to me, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of communication in general in life, but this communication is something that I think we've struggled with. And so to find ranches that are willing to do that and sit down with the the daughter-in-law and whoever else and put together these, these agreements, they're important. And to a lot of people, it seems like it's evident, but it, but it may not be. And having it in writing, I mean, even me, if I do something with my brothers, like we get it in writing, my dad, we get it in writing. It's just one, my brain is horrible and I can't remember anything I said, but two, right. It's just, it's just there. And and there's nothing mistrustful about it. It's just good business practices. Right. So, so I I agree. And, and, and I think that um, another important part of this conversation is I think often we are outside employees in some ways get better benefits than our family employees because we got to keep them right. Mm-hmm. The family we're going to work like a dog, and the, the our employees we have to have you know some vacation available and whatever. So I think that's another important part is making sure everyone is treated as an employee, so so to speak. Yeah. That family members are getting rest and time away too. You know, mental health right now is a conversation really going on with a lot of extension programs and stuff like that because it, it needs to be. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is is a big a big thing that is one of those that we've just got to continue to uh, keep in front of us. And I think that you know I was just getting ready for an, another uh, deal that I've got coming up, and I was listening to some stuff to get ready for it. And this and this guy was saying, you know, one of the things that he does. Or, or just the way that we're wired, like we've got 11 million uh, sensory receptors or something like that in our brain, and 90% of those are dedicated to sight. And so uh, mm-hmm. he puts things up where he can see them, you know. So you've got mm-hmm. these goals, you've got these to do lists, you know, keeping them in your head maybe isn't the best way to keep track of them or even your agreements, you know, like, Oh, I agreed that I would get that thing done. I'd get that taken care of. I'd get that phone call made. I'd get that marketing yeah. plan in place, you know, put it up on a, on a whiteboard or uh, in my case on a bulletin board, you know, print, print it out, stick it up there and you can see it and uh, make sure that it doesn't just become part of the, the mass of other things that are stuck up there so that you can uh, continue yeah. to refer back to it until it's done, take it down. Put it away. Put something else that's up the, up there. So I think just some of those strategies. Anything else as far as those strategies are concerned, or think tools that you found helpful? No, I think for me it's just about educating yourself a little bit. Um, there's there's only a few people out there in the ag industry that are really kind of uh, human resource in the ag industry type people. But seek them out and get on some of their email lists mm. and, and some stuff like that. I know there's there's some uh, lectureships that happen about you know, human resources in the ranching industry, management, people management in the ranching industry. Um, you know, just seek out some of those and go to one or two. It just 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 to get your brain rolling. Right. You, know, you don't have to you don't have to adopt everything they say, but just get that brain mulling around. And and again it's it's gonna be personal to your folks and your operation. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. And I, I think that it's um in today's world, there's oftentimes a, a Zoom live stream or, or a YouTube live stream that you can watch. And I would recommend either, you know, dedicating one person to watch it and take notes and bring it back to the group or the whole group to just sit down and watch it together. <laughs> you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah, agreed. 100%. <laughs> so the next is up. Uh, next up is financial. Uh, some of these financial risk uh you know, sources of risk that we're, we're seeking to pay attention to. Can you give me some examples of what you're thinking about there? Yeah. And, and, and in some ways I kind of already gave my big plug for this, you know, financial is really where all the other four areas feed into, in my opinion, right? Like, like your legal risk can have financial repercussions, losing uh, employees can have financial repercussions. So, but um in particular, this is a discussion about really 
cost, you know, incomes and expenditures. And, and it's really that simple on the surface level. We, we all know it's not that simple down the road, but, but so your financial risk is, is one, making sure your costs don't elevate too high and two, making sure you can capture, you know, the best of the market, so to speak. And again, this discussion has to start with good financial records. Cause if you don't know, I, you know, I got to, I got a neighbor down the road and I, I haven't talked to him about this, but I had one of his friends tell me, Oh yeah, he just, he just hands the checkbook to his accountant at the end of the year and says, do my taxes. And I'm going, okay, that maybe he's just that good and is running a really nice streamlined operation, but probably not. He's an older gentleman. He's probably been doing stuff the same way for 50 years. And there's probably some areas that he can, he can maybe get his costs down and maybe capture a better market. So, uh, you know, that's, again, my shameless plug, like we have got to have good financial records or else you don't know. It's like walking into well, talking about profitability without good financial records is like going to a foreign country, not being able to speak the language. Mm. Like you just, you can't make any sense of anything. Right. Right. And and so that that's kind of my, my starting point on the financial discussion. And again, that that illustration of going to a foreign country without being able to speak the language is if you if you just can't do it, find a translator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is our our previous discussion about a bookkeeper, right? Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's really important, and and I think all the big um, I don't want to say big players, but um, there's a lot of people that understand this, and they're being more effective. They're successful because of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this, and I, please don't let me derail you, but I think on this financial thing, one of the things that came to mind earlier is don't let the tax preparer run the business. You know, you were talking about making a purchase to avoid taxes. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to pay taxes, right? Death and taxes. Those are two certainties in life. <laughs> yeah. um, and paying, writing that check as bad as it stinks and as, as poorly as it's going to get managed when you write it, you know, you know, you're going to write that check and they're going to mm -hmm. waste it. We know that, yeah. but yeah. It, it's a badge of honor in, in ranching. I succeeded in yeah. ranching this year because yeah. I made money. Now I have to write the check. It's just managed to have to write that check on some level, right? Know that it's yeah. going to be a consequence of good management. I would say. Yeah, and frankly, I would way rather write the check to the tax man than be going to my bank for an operating loan. Yes. You know what I mean? Because that's those are two very different places to be in life. Yeah. And and uh, you know, I don't I don't like either of them per se, but I'd way rather take the profitability. Especially when so. we are facing as much uncertainty as we are right now in agriculture with the input costs becoming, mm -hmm. you know, totally unpredictable. I mean, good yeah. luck. Good luck pred predicting your fertilizer costs for 2023. Yeah. Good luck with that. And good luck <laughs> yeah, with that, produce, that, predicting your fuel costs for 2023. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's not um, – the unpredictability might change. You know, we may find some more stability in the world, but we are now a global economy. I mean, think about the, the beef exports and imports that are happening. And so it, we, the black swan events are going to become as common as they've been because everything worldwide will trickle back to us in some way or another. I mean, you know, however many years ago, I, I mean, I don't even dare say, but a, a war in, with Russia and Ukraine wouldn't have affected us as much because it would have been a more national supply chain. Well, almost all the supply chains now are international supply chains. Yep. Yep. You know, and I, I don't remember anything much about this movie, but the butterfly effect, the movie is Ashton uh -huh. Kutcher movie from, you know, yeah. way back. And, you know, kind of that, the butterfly flaps its wings in South America and, you know, we've got mm -hmm. a hurricane in <laughs> Florida, yeah. you know, yeah. so it, there's just these things that we don't even think are going to cause us an issue, but then all of a sudden, you know, uh, nitrogen fertilizer is three times as expensive as it was last year. And who, who saw that coming? So, yeah. And, and, you know, when we get to kind of production risk, I'm, I'll touch on this a little bit too, but we need to start looking at our management practices too, so that we can see how maybe we could find 
So maybe long term, our yield averages come down a little bit per se, but maybe we find a more st- stable place to be in our production. You know, those types of, of, of discussions and, and decision making. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm all for sustainability. Um, I appreciate that. But I think that it's it's a, a good starting point. Um, regenerativity is probably where we really want to go. We want to go to making it better, not just making it do what it's always done, but making it better, you know, yeah. getting getting yeah. more return from the resources because of management. And there are people who are doing it in every sector, be it row yeah. crop, be it uh, cattle, grass. There's people doing it, but it, you've got to, you can't just keep doing what you've always done necessarily in, in those regards. So let's, yeah, let's move on to production. Uh, what, what are some of the, you were, you were mentioning the management thing. What are some of those things? Yeah. You know, the, the production is the one that everybody wants to talk about. Right. So this is the easy one to look at, but you know, to your point, right. Uh, the regenerative movement really talks about, um, stocking rates and, and rest. You know, I mean, if you want to talk about the, the break down the simplicity of how they manage grazing, right? And so you may need to either create some infrastructure or um, maybe just lessen, if you don't have the, the money for infrastructure, reevaluate how you stock your pastures, which in the short term may feel like you're giving something up. But in the long term, right, if you've been mad, so I I experienced this firsthand. I bought cattle from a gentleman in Colorado and leased back his range. My first year we hit D4 drought, (laughs) but he had been conservatively managing his pastures Mm. for so long that I didn't have to sell anything. Wow. And, and, And we grazed it a little harder than I would have liked to. But man, there was still foot tall grass up under the sagebrush. You know what I mean? So, so although maybe he could have maximized that long term in that drought situation, he was okay. We were okay. And I've seen that over and over and over and over again. I think, um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time on some big South Texas ranches and down there, it's so volatile mm-hmm. that they just have to keep some standing forage kicking around. And, and it's hard too, because, it's a lot of those warmer tropical grasses. They don't, they don't hold their nutrition as well, but their stocking rates are so conservative down there because they learned kind of the hard way. You know, these are, these are generational ranches who and, and progressive generational ranches that have been able to look and learn from mistakes along the way, you know, and kind of to illustrate the other side of that, I had a right next door neighbor and man, he just grazed the crud out of everything. And when it was dry, guess who had cows in the corral mm. or on his hay meadow or had to buy more? You know what I mean? So, so these production decisions, while on the surface may feel like you're giving something up, it, to me, it goes back to that long-term vision. Let's not look so much on, on the pennies for today. Let's look at, at the dollars for tomorrow. Yeah. So. Yep. Yep. And talk about some of the, uh, some of the ways to, uh, mitigate this risk, uh, you know, is diversification, mm-hmm. integration and insurance. So can you kind of talk to me about what you mean by each one of those? Yeah. So, so I think diversification is, is probably a hard one for a lot of people. They, um, but let me tell you, you, you start this noble research Institute is going really hardcore regenerative right now, mm-hmm. which is really cool. And I love, I got to spend some time with them when I was in my grad program there. I love noble research Institute. Well, they recognize the need for kind of multi-species grazing to get some more out of their pastures and, you know, just to see impacts, different impacts. Well, so they've added sheep and those sheep think about compare this to cattle, right? There, those sheep in year one paid off half their note. <laughs> you know what I mean? And their stocking rates on their cattle haven't hardly changed, which I've done some research on this before. And that's what, what most research shows is that you can run them concurrently or behind each other or in front of each other. And your stocking rates on that have changed. Well, can you imagine if now you've added a whole new revenue stream without sacrificing anything else? 
and not that I'm recommending all ranchers go out and buy sheep. And of course, I'm sure a bunch of your listeners are sheep guys and they're going, well, yeah, it's because we're smart, right? Good job, guys. They looked really smart for the last three years. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The last three years. Um, but so anyway, so, so I think um, diversification and, and it doesn't have to be livestock. So many ranchers now are putting a cabin up in the hills and renting it out are offering outfitter services. You know, when you've got thousands of acres, like a lot of these Western ranches do, there is a lot of money in tourism. And and like I said, I've worked in in ag tourism. And if you are not at least considering it on your property in some way, shape or form, you're probably leaving money on the table. And, And the cool thing about it is you can do it at whatever level you want, whether it's the dry cabin out back, or the fancy lodge that you rent out to corporations. And as long as you are accurately describing and advertising what you have, there is a customer for it. Hmm. When you start talking about the percent of our population, who's two, three generations removed from agriculture, it's this novelty. Mm -hmm. I used to joke that as a cowboy in, in real heavy tourism areas like um, West Yellowstone, Montana, Jackson hole, even I worked for a, I ran a ranch for a large resort. You're like Santa Claus. <laughs> you know, you say, oh, he's a real cowboy. And like, well, as opposed to what, you know? So, so anyway, that, I think that's another part of, of how diversi- diversification is, is important. And I would say that all, all of those can be subcontracted. Even the sheep yes. can be subcontracted. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, and, and kind of back to that human resources uh, discussion, um, we we didn't get into, and we've said it too many times probably, but we didn't get into ranching because we enjoyed working with people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so yeah. it, not that we have that opportunity or that option, you know, it's a people business you're going to have to figure out. And I think that look back to what you said about financial uh, people who are uh-huh. doing well uh, in this business are people who know these numbers and are paying attention to them. And I think the same is said for, and they're, they're the same people a lot of times, the people who understand how to work with people are the ones that are doing this well. And so if you're going to get into direct marketing beef, if you're going to get into, uh, you know, a a hunting lodge, if you're going to get into uh, grazing sheep, those are all going to be probably different layers of people that you're going to have to deal with. But you could subcontract out the direct dealing with the groups of people to dealing with just one subcontractor who's going to manage the hunting lease, who's going to manage the, the lodge or, I, you know, Sage Askin uh, said one time mm-hmm. on the Working Cows podcast, he said, I think the average 300 cow ranch could sell 100 cows and bring in a, a herder and a thousand sheep because, you know, the conventional wisdom is five ewes to one cow. And mm-hmm. he's saying we can double that by bringing in a herder. And, you know, the herder's expenses are covered by the thousand ewes. And whether you yeah. own them or not, they're, they're bringing in another whether it's a lease deal or, or whatever, they're bringing yeah. in another revenue stream. And, and I think that that's, you know, just kind of back to that outside the box thinking uh, yeah. that, that are there's opportunities and it doesn't have to be another, oh, I've got to deal with groups of 50 people. You know, if that's not your thing, you can find somebody who is looking for an opportunity to be involved in ranching and bring that other diversified enterprise into, into your operation. Yeah. And I think one of my favorite discussions about um, keeping family in the ranch is I talked to a couple of ranchers who say, if my kids want to come back to the ranch, they have to come to me with a viable business option and we're going to look at it. And then, and then that's what they're doing. We're not all going to come cowboy because we can't, like we don't need 20 cowboys. Right. And so again, that this idea is, is um, diversification can also off- offer opportunity for uh the next generation could you give me an example of a couple of or a couple of examples of integration yeah so integration um and uh, integration is one that i think can happen again it's it's scalable right so uh integration could be as simple as as kind of retaining your cattle right you hold on to them through the whole process or it may be if you are a so you feed a lot of hay, right? A lot of us uh, in the in the winter states, so to speak, you know, we just got to feed however many months out of the year. 
So having a lease on or some owned irrigated alfalfa ground or whatever is going to be important. And that, and then someone can say that integration because it's outside of your wheelhouse of, of that's farming, right? Not, not cattle. And, and some would argue against that and that's fine, but for the purpose of the argument, right. Or maybe you do have a little yard. And so now you're going to figure out where you're getting your grain from. And, and sometimes having control over that, that supply chain is going to be, is going to be really important. Um, I think that another example might be um, owning versus buying your replacements, right? So that's another example of of like a a integrated operation instead of having one thing that you do really well. And it's funny because in some ways it's like diversification, but to me, diversification is horizontal. Integration is more vertical where, where you're taking control over different areas of the, of the birth to, to finish process Mm -hmm. in, in the ranching industry. And so I think that's another example. And, and these, these can be really hard decisions to make, you know, it, it, again, it's going to depend on your operation. Maybe you can raise replacements super cheap and that's great. Good for you. And maybe, maybe you do have a quality source for your feedstuffs and that's good too, but there's risk there. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was, when I was running that ranch in Colorado, we had this weird bubble in the hay market and it went, I mean, it went to unfortunately what prices are like right now, but however many years ago it was astronomical. Well, it's not that it's, it's a little high now too, but, um, and I I had been buying from the same guy for two or three years and he came to me and said, Hey, I'm, I'm asking what the market is in the County. And I said, well, I'm not paying what the market is in the County because I know North I 70, those guys are getting rain. And so, instead of working with me and that's his choice, you know, and I told him, if you can go get it, go get it. But I mean, I was mm-hmm. buying like truckloads of hay. Um, I said, if you can get it, that's great, but I'm, I'm not paying that. And so there goes my hay supply. Luckily I had a connection uh, up in, you know, I was in Western Colorado. We were close to Utah and I had some connections up there that helped me find some hay. And I got it shipped down from almost Northern Utah for cheaper than he was wanting. So anyway, the point being your supply chains can flex. And so you might feel like you're in a good spot, but if your operation is highly dependent on it, you either need to account for volatility or for the loss of access, or you need to maybe get a little more control over that. Yep. Yep. And, and I guess the other piece of this, we mentioned diversification, and integration and then insurance. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you're thinking about there? Yeah. So, so this is really interesting. And this is where I think a lot of the tools have uh, evolved more recently. And by more recently, we're probably talking the last 10 years, really aggressively, you know, there's always been some mortality insurance. And again, that's, you know, if you're high leveraged on your cattle, you probably want to have some mortality insurance on your cows. If you're, really a cash operator, then, you know, you can absorb a little more loss there. But um, really what we're talking about now is these things that can, that can um, help mitigate that, that risk for these production and or market type stuff. Right. So pasture range land and forage is the big one that that we do. And it's a lot of people are hearing about it, especially with the prolonged droughts that we've been having in such a huge percent of the country. And what pasture rangeland and forage is, is you're you're insuring your pasture production, right? Because we all know in times of drought, your pastures are going to be less quality and not last as long. And that's going to have repercussions down the line. Either you're rebreed on your cattle because body condition scores low or your calving weights, your calving, uh, your your fertility, you know, as far as... um, not fertility, but your ability for your cow to wean a calf, you know, your cow's milk. Anyway, all those things that so many ranchers don't understand probably better than I do. Um, But think about it. If you can cover that pasture and get insurance indemnities payouts when it doesn't grow. I mean, I'm trying to stay cool, but like this is a big deal for a lot of ranchers. 
we just did kind of a PRF basics webinar and had some, you know, did some video that we're going to start floating out to people. And one of the big things we talk about in that is at least get some numbers on this program because we're talking net 75% of the time or better. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's, it's really designed and, and just a quick background on it. It's really the rancher's crop insurance. And, and really I've come to understand, you know, a lot of people really don't like subsidized programs, but I've come to understand it's the USDA's commitment to food security that really drives a lot of this. It's not really a bailout. It's making sure that if everything goes to pot, we can feed our country, you know? So that has really changed my ability to look at a lot of these programs. But anyway, that's, that's a kind of rant on that part of, of insurance, but there's other stuff too: livestock risk protection, which protects against downturns in the market. It's a lot of us don't have access to, to hedging. We either don't have the volume or don't have the overhead capital to ha- to do the uh, to handle the the margins and stuff. And this LRP is really cool because you can protect your floor without risking your upside. Because on a hedge, really all you're doing is locking in your margin, right? If it goes up, you lose on the hedge. If it goes down, you lose in the market. But LRP provides an opportunity to protect that that risk associated with your price on your production. And the cool thing is, in my opinion, it it doesn't even matter what you get for your calves. So you can sell your calves. You can go to any type of premium, you know, kickback, you know, black Angus, whatever you want it to be, and hopefully do really well on your calves and still protect against a downturn in the futures market without really trying to do it an actual hedge. So, um, and there's several different programs like that. We've got, there's whole farm pro, pro uh, revenue programs. There's um, livestock gross margin for these guys that are a little bit integrated and, and have feedstuffs. And so this insurance game is, is changing quite a bit. It's more than I think it, you, it, and people think of it like your car insurance. Well, I'm going to pay $200 a, a month and never have an accident and just throw that money away. <laughs> but really a lot of these programs are designed to benefit ranchers it's it's really stacked in their favor which seems so odd but it, it, it's really the case and that's the subsidy at work right i mean yeah. basically the difference between your car insurance and your prf insurance is that your your car insurance isn't subsidized so you you right. do it does go <laughs> into yeah. a hole and you don't have the accident you don't collect but it's there if right. you need it right and the prf insurance and here i mean you know kind of back to your rant and, and the way that i rationalize it in my mind and somebody can email me and tell me i'm i'm just rationalizing <laughs> it and i'll be okay with that but yeah. the way i rationalize it in my mind is kind of back to that that discussion i had about sent writing that check <laughs> on the tax payment is that i'm getting a little bit of that back and i will get the opportunity to manage it better than they will you know, yeah. I paid the taxes and I'm getting a little bit of it back. And and I, I use that same rationalization on equip and CSP programs and, and those kinds of things is it's a little bit of the, what I've paid in coming back and I'm going to do a better job of using it than they will. So I don't really feel that bad about getting it. <laughs> yeah, so. I agree. And and it's funny because and everyone teaches their own, but I have talked with guys who over 20 year average per year netted, I mean, over a hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, seventy five. And they don't have anything to do with it because of the, because of the subsidy. Right. But somebody else is and argue that to your point, like you're getting back, you're paying taxes and it's going back out to help somebody. And they're just going to have a competitive advantage against you now. Right. These are guys that aren't liquidating right now because they're buying forage or they're trucking cattle because they have the the liquid funds to do it now. Yep. And I, you know, I mean, when I went through the High Plains Ranch practicum with Dallas Mount, uh, Aaron Berger, Dallas has gone on to run ranch management consultants. He pulled up the PRF insurance and he sh- walked us through it and he showed a specific ranch and he said, if they would have had this in place over the last 25 years, they would be $200,000 richer today than they are. <laughs> you know, and yeah. and it was a gr- it was a couple sitting in the class, you know, and and I'm sure they've got PRF now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I need more guys like that. But, <laughs> but it really is. Um, there's so many programs out there. You don't have to do them all. Right. But look into them. 
get numbers. And my my kind of my last plug here on PRF, go go with someone who has really good software. Because what we do is we'll look at, it's based off your 70 year average rainfall. And then when you insure up to a certain percent of your 70 year average, well, that's a lot of data to try and do with them pencil and paper. And so find someone who has a really good software to run the numbers. Cause not only does it really analyze the, the historic data that your policy is based on. I mean, I just ran one this morning, did 180,000 iterations of coverage, right? Like I can't do that myself. So just that's, that's kind of my last plug on, on past range line of forage. Yep. And, and red summit does offer a suite of these, uh, programs right i mean you guys yeah doing the prf and the lrp and or, we some PRF, lrp we're, we're um we can offer basically any of the usda uh program the rma programs is really where they're coming from sure and we're actually um as we as we are lucky enough to move further east we recognize the need for a lot of these integrated right or diversified however you, want, you know operations that maybe need some crop insurance so we're slowly working that way as well, but there's a there's a lot of information there that we're digging through. So so that's um, yeah, but we definitely all the RMA programs we we can do. And the show notes page for today is workingcows.net slash two sixty four. Workingcows.net slash two six four. You can go there and find uh, links to that that webinar you mentioned earlier uh, that you that you guys just did. Is that going to be available to the public? Yes, I believe it's, um, I think there's some discussion about how they're going to do it, but I think it's already on the YouTube channel. I okay. will, I can verify that and get back to you. Sure. But I'll, if, <laughs> if it's available, I will have links to that in, or it will be embedded in the show notes page at workingcows.net slash 264. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure we'll make it available. And that, the whole goal of that was information without the sales pitch. So we tried really to be objective and just put out as much information based off of questions that we get all the time. Sure. All right. And so I think that brings us to the last one, unless you've got something else to say, but the last one, and, the, and that's the marketing risk. Yeah. Yeah. And marketing risk, this is where we start talking about the black swan and that, right? Um, there are so many things right now that are, that are affecting the market. And actually I'm surprised our market has stayed as stable as it has this year, which a lot of guys I'm talking to are saying the same thing. They're like, well, that's, you know, and we don't have to dive into that because that's probably a whole podcast itself. But um, I talk a little bit about the, the who, what, when, where, and why of your marketing. And this is kind of something I came up to after reading through a lot of stuff about marketing your cattle. And I really, and really like the way you lay this out, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it just kind of made sense to me. And granted, that doesn't necessarily mean it makes sense to everyone, but <laughs> I'll kind of go through it. So, so this is the, the, the W's of marketing. So the first is who. Who are you marketing your product to? Are you a seed stock guy? Are you marketing directly to the feedlots? Are you providing cattle to guys who are going to have a stalker operation? Are you end user marketing, right? Because that really affects what you're producing and how you're going to market, right? If and you are the inputs ahead. you're willing to put into it, you know, yeah. uh, and depending on who your customer is, the input you put into that animal may uh, increase or detract from its value. You know, yeah. the, the, the whole suite of vaccines and, and nasal mm -hmm. gin products and those things might really be attractive to the cattle buyer in the, in the sale barn, but yeah. to your, your city neighbor who you're direct marketing that beef to might not yeah. be as attractive to them. So, I mean, it, this is a, a, a know who you are selling yeah. to and then, yeah produce the animal that they are drooling to have. <laughs> yeah. And I think we need to listen to our consumers, whatever that is, but we need to be careful about chasing trends. Mm -hmm. So, cause that there's a lot of money that goes into chasing trends just to have the trends change in, in five years. So. And gestational um, lag is a hard thing when you're chasing trends, you know, it takes you yeah. two or three or five or six years to make a, a meaningful change in the herd. So yeah. it, it, it can be hard to chase those trends cause they change faster than you can. Yeah. Uh, the next one is what, so, and this is a similar discussion, but what are you marketing? What is your product? If you're seed stock, are you raising more females or more bulls? If you're, you know, if you're going to the, the feedlots, are you wanting, are you raising high marble stuff 
or you're raising high volume stuff or are you trying to do both? Right. So, so um, one thing that really opened my mind on what is I did a, a project for a, a feed lot and they wanted to know that we were talking about gains versus value, but they said, our market, what we are selling is a skinned, uh, you know, a skinned carcass on the rail. Well, that changes how you manage that and where that break even is. So we had to convert all their gains to carcass gains and we converted all their, uh, you know, incomes to, to carcass weight incomes. And, and um, so what are you marketing, right? Are you marketing your calves? Are you marketing your beef? Are you marketing, you know, because that, again, will change how you manage it. And I think that those animals that market and grade well are going to be a different kind of animal than the animal that excels on the range. And so mm-hmm. if you're going to that end, it might mean that you run fewer head than your neighbor and that might, yeah. you know, hurt your ego at the coffee shop. Your belt <laughs> buckle might be smaller, you know, yeah. <laughs> but hopefully your wallet's thicker. <laughs> and so, yeah. 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 I agree. Um, the next one is when, when are you marketing? So this is, you know, so many of us are spring calvers and fall marketers and that's great. I mean, that's fine. It, it, a lot of it in the Northern country is because of weather, you know, nobody wants to feed pregnant cows through the winter. Um, but can you change how, when you're marketing to hit some highs or can you, uh, feasibly do a dual calving herd or, you know, when, when are you marketing now and when could you market that, that works better? Um, you know, is part of this is about what you're producing. And part of this is about, can you change your program to, to capture more dollars? And Wally Olson, you know, uh, changed my paradigm on this when somebody in his marketing school asked him, why did you calve in the fall? And it was from somebody probably north and west of me, you know, Mm -hmm. in your neighborhood or or somewhere, Montana or whatever. And he said, I was I was calving in the fall because I could do it on green grass, you know, Mm -hmm. and so that's a, a win question. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. What is your, what is your environment tell you, you are uh, warranted in doing. Yeah. And even if we get away from the cow calf guy and start talking about stalkers or, you know, whatever, well, where, where are people calving out the calves that you're going to want when it's time to go on, on grass. Right. And and how do you get a hold of them? And is it worth maybe paying a little bit extra? I mean, this is, you got to do the numbers. Is it worth paying a little extra to ship somebody and get these good calves from somebody further South or whatever, when you're ready to go on grass? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, next one is where, and uh, you know, I could harp on this for a while, but again, it, it, these all have a similar vein, right? Are you just dropping your calves at the, at the local auction barn and bless the local auction barn. They're so imperative in the market, but your weaned calves at the mark at the local auction. I don't know that that's the best choice for most guys. Your coal cows. Sure. Do it. Your coal bulls. Great. But my personal opinion is if you're, everybody's running their calves to the local sale barn, at least look at some other options. I'm not saying you're wrong, but, but at least broaden your horizon a little bit. The local sale barns recognize this too, right? And I, I can give you a perfect example. I know a guy who uh, 25 years ago probably sold his calves. He was working at a sale barn and he sold his calves on the video and he got fired from the sale barn, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know? And now, now all of the calves sold on the video go to the local auction barn and run across the scale to get weighed because they mm-hmm. recognize the change. And so, yeah. I mean, it's... They're, they're part of the, the system now. It's not yeah. like they're, they're going to become obsolete or unnecessary. They're part of the system. Yeah, agreed. So, so. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And then this too can be, um, you know, for those of you who are, who are able to do some end user marketing, where are you marketing that? Mm. Are you online? Are you just farmers markets? Do you have a large population of, of, um, retail consumers? Do you have a large population of restaurants? Like where can you get this product out and where are you going to be able to capture the most dollar for your product? 
And then the last is the why. And I think this is really important because um, it feeds into the rest of the context. Why are you marketing the way that you do? And this is just an honest question for yourself. Why am I running my calves through the sale barn? Why am I weaning in October and marketing then? Why am I X, Y, Z, whatever? And <clears throat> some people will find the answer to that <clears throat> to be very potent and, and give good cause for what they're doing. And some people might realize if they're honest with themselves, oh, because it's a heck of a lot easier to me to wean onto the truck and just be done with them. By the time fall rolls around or whatever, I'm so tired. I just want to put my feet by the fire. <laughs> so, you know, ask yourself why, and then, and then think differently just for a minute. You may decide what you're doing is great, but take a minute to think differently for a little while. Yep. And I think that the why, you know, um, money, as far as compensating, I think the why can be part of, of, of employees too, part of that human, human deal, human resources deal. We all have a why and, and that yeah. why is, is a performance generator in the people. Mm -hmm. If they know the why they catch the vision, they know what we're doing and why we're doing it. They can, they will perform better. And I don't think the money will make them perform better, but I think that the money will help them stick around longer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. so money is about retention, and why is about performance. And I think that those are some things that we should probably pay a, a little bit closer attention to. So, and I think we're often afraid of the why. Uh, you know, I think about my my kids, and I've got my oldest is pretty intelligent, and I'll admit he gets it from his mom, <laughs> but um, he for a while there, he just kept asking me all these questions and it felt like he was challenging me. Mm. And speaking of those rough, rough rancher cowboy types, right. <laughs> you know, be quiet and do what I say. And it finally dawned on me once he just wants to know, like he literally, he doesn't even care what the answer is. He just wants to know. And I think it's that way a lot in ranching, you know, grand grandkid might show up to grandpa and be like, grandpa, why do we this? And he's like, well, are, you know, are you questioning my, you know, like, no, he just wants to know and empower him that way or her give her that information so that later they can go make educated decisions when they start doing their own thing. Yeah. And, and, and it works intrinsically too. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Ross, I really appreciate the, the time today. Anything else you were hoping to, to cover? No, it's been awesome. I, I just, love talking about this stuff. I mean, I'm really passionate about the industry anyway, and I see this risk management or risk mitigation as so important moving forward. Yep. Yep. And it's again, keeps, keeps, the, keeps the, the industry viable. So yeah, very good. Yeah. Well, as I said, um, we'll have links to, we'll have relevant links up at workingcows.net slash 264. But uh, Ross for now, thank you for your time today. I uh, enjoyed it. Are you looking to quickly and efficiently buy or sell agriculture products to, or to get the word out about your ag event? Avoid the headaches of using non-ag marketplaces or classified sites and check out farmingtheweb.ca, Canada's best free classified site designed by and for Canadian farmers. Very good stuff. Really appreciate Ross's perspective. Uh, very much look forward to uh, continuing to uh, work with Red Summit. I've uh, been working with them on my own place with some uh, PRF insurance, so very, very good, easy-to-use product and, and been enjoying that as well. So uh, looking forward to next week. Coming up on the Working Cows podcast, we will be talking with Elaine Fraze, and we're going to be talking to her about um, – managing expectations in family communications and, and how to have healthy communications as families. And so uh, kind of bringing her on in front of her event coming up here. She's got three of them scheduled. I believe they are December 7th, 8th, and 9th. Uh, I think it's December 7th in uh, Nebraska, and December 8th in Chamberlain, South Dakota, and December 9th in Rapid City, South Dakota. And the Rapid City event is hosted by uh, South Dakota Farm Bureau Districts 5 and 6, which is basically 
Western South Dakota. We're getting together to bring Elaine in for uh, a day. So she'll be here from 10 to 3. And then that evening, there's actually a Zach Williams Christmas concert. So you could make a kind of a nice Friday out of it. So uh, come and enjoy uh, that with us. December 9th at the Holiday Inn in Rapid City Uh, should be a registration link up in the show notes page for next week so that you can come and join us for that. So I encourage you to check that out. Coming your way real soon, another another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week. Are you looking f- Are you looking to quickly and efficiently buy or sell agricultural products or to get the word out about your uh, upcoming ag event? Avoid the headaches of using non-ag marketplaces.